All right, you just built a house in two minutes and 17 seconds. Wasn't that fun? Just built a house in two minutes and 17 seconds. Uh, we're going to show you a little bit, beginning of that a little bit later. But building a house, I don't know, that made me tired. I need a nap. It takes a little longer than two minutes and 17 seconds to build a house, but that's exactly what we are doing. Our theme that we're looking at this month is building God's house. Building God's house. Building God's church. And it comes from uh, a series of messages we're doing, and it's building God's church. September 7th, today, building God's foundation. Next week, we'll look at building his house, the house itself. September 21st, filling his house. Now, September 21st is also what? Back to church Sunday, and you're inviting all your family and friends and neighbors and to come to church and fill the church, people you may haven't seen during the summer, and being sure we're here to fill his church. And then September 28th, using his house. What it means to be a house of God and what he expects of us and wants us to do with being his house. All of this comes out of a vision and a mission and a passion of Jesus. I, I unfolded this last week. Some of it will be, be new to some of you. But the vision of Jesus comes from John chapter 6, verse 38. His vision. He said, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. The vision of Jesus was to do and to be what God had sent him to do and to be. The mission of Jesus was to seek and save the lost. That's why he came. To seek and save. Out of that vision, to do God's will, God sent him to seek and save the lost. And the passion of Jesus, how he fleshed that out, was to establish the church. Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. No matter what all other organizations we have, God gave us the church. Jesus died for the church and gave himself for her. And so those are things, I want you to keep that in mind. These are important pegs. They're going to really become important as we get to the later part of the month. But remember that vision and mission and passion of Jesus. Now, this is the base scripture for our whole theme this month. It comes from 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 8, or verse 5, rather. Let's say it together. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Now, that was almost audible. We're going to continue to read this until I can hear you. Let's do it again. You also, are as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. That was much better. Thank you for indulging this balding pastor. That is the premise. Last week, we began with this base scripture, and in that is that phrase, being built up a spiritual house. We are to be a spiritual house of God. Quick recap. We asked the question, where do you start to build up a spiritual house? We start with the designer, and here is what we understand. In, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, it says that we are living stones. If you back up to verse 4, as we looked at last week, Jesus Christ, it says, coming to him, Jesus, as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious, you also as living stones. You and I are to be living stones like Jesus is the living cornerstone of our lives. And we are to be him in our lives and in our world. Holy and accept. How do we do that? Well, we do that by our spiritual sacrifices right there in this verse. To offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. Be a believer, a living stone. And if you are a believer, laying aside all malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby, it says in those two, first two verses of chapter 2. That's what we looked at last week. Now, since we're all up to speed, let's take a moment to look at the start of this video again. Bruce, if you'll put this on hold and just start the beginning of that video, we're just going to look at a portion of it. Pay close attention to what we look at this morning.
should be music and they're going da 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 All right, you can stop it right there. Just, just, you can get it off of there now. I'm done with it for today. What did you notice? What did you notice when, when the video first started? Well, when I think of building a house, I don't necessarily think that I've got to tear something down to build something up. But if you notice, they had to tear down the old house to build the new house. Here's a reality. We'll get into Scripture in a minute, but here's the reality. Your walk with God, what we call the walk of faith, can't be an addition to your current lifestyle, your current life. You can't add Jesus, you can't add on the walk of faith to the building you already have. It doesn't work. The building is old. The building is broken. The building is leaky. It's tired, dirty, and beyond the need of repair, it needs to be torn down. Hear me. The only way, the only way to have a house built by God that is you, what you were designed and created to be, is if you're willing to tear down the old house. You're willing to say, this old house is a mess. This old house needs to be replaced. I need a fresh start. Tear down the old house. That's the first thing you notice in that little clip. They had to tear down the old house. That means lifestyle, attitudes, actions, thoughts, All of this must be given to the designer to tear down and build anew. And that's that's some of the hardest thing for us. We got a lot of stuff we like to hold on to, whether it's good stuff or bad stuff. But the reality is to build the house of God as in us, the old stuff has to go. The old house has to go down. How do you know what to tear down? Well, it's easy. My mother didn't remind me of this this week, but over and over again, I hear this little phrase in my mind. My mother would tell me when I was, was growing up, and, and I'd ask the question, you know, I'd, I'd come to her with a, with a T-shirt. It, it was ripped, dirty, smelly. I liked it. It was my favorite T-shirt. I'd say, Mother, is this dirty? She'd look at me and say, Son, if it's doubtful, if you have to ask the question, it's dirty. If you have to ask the question, if it's doubtful, tear it down give it to the lord it's there if there's a question tear it down if there's a believer that you know and trust that's questioning what things are going on in your life tear it down the bible his church prayer are what god the designer has given to us to help build his house of you you are his house and these things he has given us to help us to build that house. Don't miss this series on building up a spiritual house. What else did you notice in that little video segment? Well, you may have noticed that as they began to dig that foundation, they cleared the land and they dug very, very deep and they laid a permanent foundation to the house. They didn't rebuild or rebuild up on that old foundation. They dug it all out. They dug a new foundation. They laid what we call footers or foundation stone. And on that then, they put up the walls. Now, they, this particular construction, they choose to pour concrete walls. There are several ways you can do that construction, but that's not the point. The point is that they built those basement walls, if you will, those foundation walls on those footers, that foundation stone that they laid deep into the ground. Remember that, because that's where we're going to spend the rest of the time today, building on his foundation building on that foundation that is his. Now, if you have your Bible, you need to be open to 1 Peter chapter 2 because we're going to look at a couple scriptures there and you're going to need to put something in your Bible right there, a little marker, uh, your bulletin or something because we're going to go to several other scriptures this morning and come back then periodically to this passage in in, uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 6 and following. So you have your Bible open. Let's look. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 6. Therefore... It is also contained in Scripture, 
Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. This verse, this quote of Peter, is a quote from the Old Testament. You may have a note at the bottom of your Bible. It may be in italics like it is here in your Bible because he's quoting from Isaiah chapter 28, verse 16. He's quoting from the Old Testament about the cornerstone. Now, as I said, hope you have your Bible marked in, in 1 Peter here. Go over with me to Isaiah chapter 28 in your Bible. Isaiah. One of the best ways to find Isaiah, if you don't know where exactly where Isaiah is, at the middle of your Bible, if you pop it open, will be Psalms, and just keep going past that into Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 28. Isaiah chapter 28. Isaiah chapter 28, what's happening while you're turning there, what's happening at this part of the history of God's people in Isaiah is this. Catch this. God's people had been continuing to forsake him, chasing after other gods, chasing after other alliances, chasing after other pleasures and loves, and, and, and they had corrupted their worship. They had corrupted their politics. They had corrupted just about everything in their land, and God kept sending him prophets to the people to say, listen, you're getting away with this, but you don't get away with it forever because I'm going to have justice. And over and over again, God's reminding his people, I have been your God. You are covenanted to be my people, and you're not following me. And so as we pick up, pick up Isaiah chapter 28, that's what's happening. In, in Isaiah chapter 28, go with me to verse 14 and 15. It says this, Therefore, hear the word of the Lord, you scornful men, who rule this people who are in Jerusalem. Because you have said, we have made a covenant with death and with Sheol and are in agreement. When the overflowing scourge passes through, it will not come to us. For we have made lies our refuge, and under falsehood we have hidden ourselves. They were trusting in the alliances that they had made. They knew God was saying, you're going to get it. But they said, oh, no, we'll be all right. We've made alliances. We're fine. God's saying, you've made your, your foundation on lies. And then out of that, look at verse 16. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone for the foundation, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not act hastily. Also, I will make justice the measuring line and righteousness the plummet, and ha the hail will sweep away the refuse of lies, and the water will overflow the hiding place. Your covenant with death will be annulled. He's saying, God's saying, I'm at work. And here, everybody who reads this, then and now understood it, not only an immediate judgment on the people of God because of their faithlessness, but it's also a prophecy of what God was going to do. Notice what it says. I lay in Zion a, a stone for a foundation. He is laying that cornerstone. We see that, and we'll see it in a moment. It was a prophetic word. So here, he gives a prophetic passage about the cornerstone. This concept from God was older than this passage in Isaiah. Back in the Psalm, Psalm 118, if you want to turn there, it's just not too far back. Psalm 118, listen to what's going on in Psalm 118. You'll, you'll know this, this passage or, or this psalm. Psalm 118 begins, O give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endures forever. Let Israel now say, His mercy endures forever. Let the house of Aaron now say, His mercy endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord now say, His mercy endures forever. A psalm of praise to God. Now, if you, if you go down a little bit further, look at verse 19 and following. Open to me the gates of righteousness, I will go through them. And I will praise the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous shall enter. I will praise you, for you have answered me and have become my salvation. Do you hear the praise? Now, what have I said over and over and over again the last three years? God inhabits the praises of his people. Why do we have a songbook right in the middle of the Bible? Because we're supposed to praise God. We're supposed to praise God with every instrument we know, with our voices and Baptist. It even says to dance before the Lord. I said the D word in a Baptist church. I said dance. Oh, but we're supposed to just exude with praise to the Lord. That's why the songs are here. You realize that, that, that a large portion of the book of Psalms, 
are songs that the people sang as they as they walked in caravan and, 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 and walked up to Jerusalem to worship, they began to break out into song. And that's some of the psalms that are here. So here's a song of praise. And right in the middle of this song of praise, look at verses 22 and following. The stone which the builder rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Why? Because the stone... God is laying in Zion. This concept of the stone was, was old and, and deep in the history and the theology and the belief of his people. All of this was in the heart and minds of the disciples and the early believers as they saw these prophetic messages come to reality in Jesus. Now we know that because Jesus even quotes this. Go with me to Matthew chapter 21. I know I'm throwing a lot of scripture at this morning, and that's a good thing. As I said, there will be a test. Matthew 21. In Matthew 21, Jesus is teaching. And in the 21st chapter of Matthew, the Pharisees, the chief priests, the elders of the temple are questioning his authority. And so he's, he's talking to them about the authority that he has from the Father. And, and they have a lot of interplay there back and forth. And then he decides to tell them a story. We call it a parable. In verses 20, 33 and following, a certain landowner planted a vineyard, got a hedge around it, dug a wine press, built a tower. He leased it to a vine dresser and went away to a far country. When the time came for the, uh, the, the, the vintage to happen, he sent his servants to the vine dresser that they may receive the fruits. The vine dresser took the servants, beat one, killed one, stoned one. They sent other servants and did the same thing to them. Last of all, this owner says, well, I'm going to send my son. Surely they're not going to treat my son this way. They, he sends his son to the vine dresser, and they kill his son. Now the father comes back, it says. But when the vine dresser saw the son, they said among themselves, verse 38, this is his heir, come let us kill him and seize his inheritance. So they took him, cast him out, and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to the vine dresser? And those religious leaders said, well, he'll destroy those wicked men miserably and lease his vineyard to another vine dresser. And Jesus says, after that, this is what Jesus says in verse 42, Matthew 21. Have you never read the scriptures? The stone which the builder rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Jesus is telling those religious leaders this. Catch this. Wake up. You, religious leaders, God has, has sent me as the cornerstone. You have rejected me. But it is still a marvelous thing that God is doing in your eyes. Jesus understood it. He taught it to his disciples. The early church understood it. They picked it up. So much so that one of the very first messages of the early church is, is given by Peter in Acts chapter 4. I told you I was going to give you a lot of scripture. In Acts chapter 4, Acts chapter 3, Peter and John go into the temple and they heal a lame man. And you think everybody would be excited about that. Everybody except the religious leaders, they didn't like it a bit because too much attention was coming to this man named Jesus from Peter and his followers and the followers of Jesus. So in, in the fourth chapter of Acts, it says, Now as they spoke to the people, the priests, the captains of the temple, the Sadducees came among them, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. They laid hands on them, put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. However, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of men came to about 5,000. So Peter and some of the disciples were arrested. Now catch this. If you've never caught this before, catch this. What happened when Jesus was arrested in the garden? The disciples took off. And Peter stood out in the courtyard, and what did he do? Three times. He denied Jesus, even cursing that he ever knew Jesus. Jesus was among Caiaphas, the high priest, the leaders of the council, the religious leadership. That's who Jesus stood in front of. Fast forward. Jesus has been crucified and gloriously rose from the dead. He ascends to heaven. The Holy Spirit falls on Peter and the disciples. Peter stands up, preaches that great sermon, goes out in the temple, heals a lame man, and guess who he gets put in front of? That same group of men who had tried and convicted and put Jesus on that cross, now Peter has to stand in front of them. Peter, who denied him three times. Now here's Peter. What's he going to do? 
Does he start to stutter? Does he stammer? Does he not know what to say? It says in verse 5 of chapter 4, And it came to pass the next day, the rulers, scribes, all of us together, they bring him in, and they say to him in verse 7, What power or by what name have you done this? Then Peter, I like that verse, then Peter, look at it, verse 8, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people, elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well, then let it be known to all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you. Now catch this. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Peter understood it. The disciples understood it. Even when he stands up in fear of his own life, what does he say? We healed in the name of Jesus. This man stands here whole because of Jesus. You have rejected him. He is the cornerstone. He is who we build our faith on. There's no mistake about it. Jesus is the cornerstone, that which the building of God is built upon. Now, you and I both know what cornerstones are, don't we? Today, when we put a cornerstone in a building, we put it in a prominent place. It's usually a big stone. It has a date on it, maybe some other words. And those guys, I've seen churches put on Jesus is the cornerstone, and they put that in there. Sometimes those cornerstones are hollow because what we do, we put time capsules in there, and 50 years from now we'll open them up and say, boy, those people, they listen to eight-track tapes and all kinds of stuff we put in. But that is not a biblical cornerstone. In Jesus' day... And in the Old Testament day and in the New Testament day, a cornerstone was a foundation stone. It was the first stone laid as a foundation. It was the perfect stone that the builder could find. He laid that in there. Then every other stone in the foundation was measured against the cornerstone. So much so that the cornerstone became the, the most prominent stone in the foundation and everything else was built around the cornerstone. You didn't see it in their day. It was, it was dug deep. The cornerstone was laid, and every other stone was aligned with the cornerstone for the entire structure to be proper. It had to be plumb straight. It had to be, it had to be laid level because everything else was built around that cornerstone. Here, Jesus, in 1 Peter chapter 2 and in the New Testament, was and is the cornerstone, that which our, catch this, entire spiritual house is laid with and referenced to is the cornerstone, Jesus Christ. That's what he's saying in, in, in verse 6 of our passage. I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect precious. He who believes on him will by no means put to shame because then you line your life up with the cornerstone. Now that's foundationally important. You cannot build the spiritual house God wants you to be unless you are lined with the cornerstone. Aligned with the cornerstone. Look what it says in verse 7 now of our passage. Therefore, to you who believe he is precious. He is precious. Did you catch that? Is he precious to you? Is he the most precious thing to you? The foundation of your life. I've said this often. And I'll say it in public as I say it in private. I love my wife. And my wife is, is, is the most precious person on earth to me. I'll say it here. I'll say it often. It's true. God has given me a godly woman that I don't deserve. She's precious. But one of the things that, that she knows, and one of the things that makes her precious is, she knows that she's not the most precious person in my life. Jesus is the most precious person. And I know that the most precious person in her life is Jesus. And if he's not the most precious person in your life, you better look at your cornerstone, your foundation. Because that's the call here. To you who believe, he is precious. Are you seeing him as the precious cornerstone in your life? Something else here. It says, are you a foundation stone? If he is precious, then are you a foundation stone laid next to Jesus? Look back in verse 5. It says, you also, a living stone. That refers back to verse 4. Jesus is the living stone. We are to be living stones. 
We are to be just like Him and align ourselves with Him as the cornerstone. Meaning you, as a believer in Jesus, are a foundation stone. I can't draw the picture better enough. The cornerstone is laid, it's firm, it's strong, it's deep, it's true, it's square, it's level, it's plumb. Everything is perfect about it. And then all the foundation stones are aligned from the cornerstone. And you, as a believer in Jesus Christ, are a foundation stone. You may have never told you that. I've met some people, I thought they had rocks in their head, but that's not what we're talking about. A foundation stone is here. Quick Bible study over in Ephesians. I told you we were going to get into the Bible this morning. Over in Ephesians, chapter 2, very quickly. Look with me in verse 19 and following. Ephesians chapter 2, 19 and following. I'll wait till I don't hear the rustle anymore. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. Now therefore... You are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building, being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. You are a part of the prophets, a part of the prophets, uh, the, the apostles laid by the cornerstone to be the foundation upon which he builds his house in you. Now you say, preacher, get on with it. I've heard this. I got gotcha. you. Well, we don't get it. It's important for us to understand that the only alignment that we have that lasts forever is the cornerstone of Jesus Christ. Back to our passage in 1 Peter chapter 2. Something else happens here. Look at the rest of that passage. You who, who believe he is precious, but to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builder rejected has become the chief cornerstone. You can reject the cornerstone of Jesus and build on something else. You can do it. You have a free will to build your life any way you want to. You can line up with, with culture. You can line up with Money, you can line up with relationships, you can line your, your stone of your foundation of your life among all kinds of things. You can even line it up with tradition and church. But it's not the cornerstone, and it will fail. Jesus talked about the image of a man who built his house on a rock, and the winds came, and man, it stood. But who built himself on the sand, the winds came, the storm hit, and it fell. We can reject the cornerstone. But verse 8 tells us, be very, very careful. A stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because being disobedient to the word to which they were appointed. We have to be careful. The warning is given. If you reject the stone, you will stumble and your life will stumble. Here, the cornerstone, the foundation is what he calls us not only to be, but to do. Okay. What do we do with all this information at this late hour? What do we do about the foundation? Or better, how do I build on his foundation? First of all, first of all, you've got to acknowledge the designer and creator. The designer and creator is God. And as we started at the very beginning with this video, the next thing you have to do is tear down the old house. You can't add on, must lay it aside. And understand that the cornerstone has been laid recognize and accept that Jesus is your cornerstone. He is the foundation stone to build your life aligned to. Have you done that? Every Sunday morning, right before we start worship, the deacons who are here and who can meet up in the conference room and we pray right before worship. Some of you know that, most of you do, not everybody knows that. And over and over again, we pray for this to happen, God's presence to be real and powerful in worship and in Sunday school. But we also pray that someone will be open enough to the Holy Spirit to hear the message today and say, yes, Jesus, I will give you my life. Why do we do that? Because we know in a crowd this size or a crowd of three people, there's a good chance somebody doesn't know Jesus. And you're that someone this morning. 
And he is speaking to your heart right now and saying, I want you to align with me. I'll give you a rock-solid foundation. No matter what happens to you, you'll know that you know that you know that you're mine. Come today. Say, yes, Jesus, forgive me. I want to be a foundation in your house. We invite you to come today. But it also tells us today to see ourselves as living stones, aligned with the cornerstone. This means to align your life, your lifestyle, your work, your play, your agenda, your family, your relationships, everything you have aligned with the cornerstone who is Jesus. So there's really only one question. There's really only one thing this whole time comes down to is this. What is your life built upon? What do you build upon? When life falls apart or challenges come, what do you go back to as solid in your life? That's pretty personal. It's not for someone else. It's not for you to be thinking about, yeah, their lives are a mess. But it's personal right here, right now to you. Jesus is talking to you right now in the power and the words of the Holy Spirit in your heart and mind. He's asking this question, what is your life built upon? When it happens, when it doesn't go well, what do you do? Fall apart, wonder where God is, where your faith is. Let me tell you something, a very personal word. When the call came on Tuesday that my parents had been in a serious accident, that's the time you asked yourself, what's my foundation? What's not going to move because everything else has just flown apart? Now, all of you have been there. You've gotten the call that someone's in a bad wreck or someone has died. Your husband or wife has walked in and said, I can't do this anymore, I'm leaving. Your child has gotten in trouble or is sick. The boss called you in and say, hey, we got to let you go. Or on the job, they say, you're fired. Or you find out. You sit across the table from the doctor and he says the C word. What happens? What do you go to? What's your foundation? Jesus says, built on me, the cornerstone. Today, he says, look deep. What, are you, what have you built your life on? What falls apart when things go bad? Is that really how you want to live your life? He says, come today and bring that to him. Let's pray together. Father, oftentimes we, we like to go to some other place. Lord, oftentimes we wonder where our faith is. We ask ourselves the question, Lord, what, what's going to happen when that phone call comes or when the job is gone? And Lord, it's difficult for us. It's hard for us at times. Your call today is to build a spiritual house that is us in you. And we can't do that without building it on the deep foundation aligned with the cornerstone of Christ. I pray this morning, Lord, in these last fleeting moments, we'll be honest with you. We'll be honest with you about what happens whenever it seems like our world is falling apart, what we do and where we go. Work in our hearts, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing that invitation hymn. It's just a simple sentence. Speak to my heart, Lord Jesus. And let him speak. This altar's open. You may want to come here this morning and align your life with him. You may want to come and say, you know, the Lord speaking to me about where I'm going to put my foundation. I want to accept him. Come this morning. Let's pray together. Let's talk together. Let's stand. And let him speak to our heart. Speak to my heart, Lord Jesus. Speak that my soul may hear. Speak to my heart, Lord Jesus. Come every 
doubt and fear speak to my heart oh speak to my heart speak to my heart I pray yielded and still seeking thy will speak to my heart today. I want you to bow your heads. Everyone's head bowed. I'm going to do a silent invitation here as, as Doris plays. Ask yourself the question, what is my life built upon? Not the stuff that I have. Not the stuff that I want or somewhere I want to be. But right now, if your world falls apart, where do you go? This altar is open for you to come and talk with him. Father, as we opened your word this morning, you reminded us who you are and who we are in you. Lord, help us this week to look deep into our lives and ask that question, what's our foundation? Who are we aligned with? We go forth in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, don't leave. We got a little bit of work to do before we leave. I'm trying to get up what I want you to see. It's coming. This series is building God's church, being built up for a spiritual house. The vision of Jesus was to do the will of the Father. The mission of Jesus was to seek and save the lost. And his passion was the church that he gave himself for. Next week, we're going to build the house. We're going to build the house on that solid foundation. This is our theme scripture. Say it with me. You also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer a spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Good day. Amen.